today's class and the next class, we're going to talk about uh, mirrors, and we're going to talk about lenses, uh, and we're going to talk about the images that are formed by mirrors and lenses. This is a topic that we call geometrical optics. So specifically in today's class, I'm first just going to introduce some language and ideas about images, image formation. And then we'll move on to talking about images that are formed by flat or planar mirrors. And then we'll talk about images that are formed by um, curved or spherical mirrors. So that's the topic for today. Uh, when we talk about the images that are formed by flat, mir flat mirrors and by um, curved mirrors, we'll um, discuss equations, formulas that describe the properties, characteristics of the images formed by those mirrors. We'll also describe how to sketch, draw, diagram the images that are formed by um, planar mirrors and, and uh, curved mirrors. The material that we do today and the material that we do in the next class, so that is optics of mirrors and lenses, was important historically in the sense that it was the birth, the development of lenses and the development of mirrors, was the birth of both modern astronomy and uh, also modern biology. Uh, up until the development of telescopes built on mirrors and lenses and microscopes built on mirrors and lenses, um, biology and astronomy was limited, restricted to what you could see with your naked eye. Once telescopes and microscopes were developed, which is geom optics, uh, scientists could see unseen worlds. So they could see the unseen worlds of the very small that allowed for the development of modern biology. And they could see the unseen worlds of the very distant in the, in the, um, in the universe. And that opened the world of modern astronomy. So what we're doing in today's class and what we're doing in next class in optics, with mirrors, with lenses, was very important historically in opening up these unseen worlds for modern biology and um, modern astronomy. So this slide has some basic information on this concept, this idea, this notion of an image. So an image is a, a copy or a likeness or a representation of an object. So an image of you would be a copy uh, or a, um, a likeness or a representation of you. An image of a tree would be a, a copy or a likeness of a representation of a tree. Um, here's a couple of examples of images. This one is of a tree. This one is of a you, I guess. Um, so uh, here's an image formed of a tree. Obviously, this is not the real tree. And um, this is an image that's formed by a mirror. This is an image that's actually formed by a, what we would call a convex mirror. It's a curved mirror. And it has certain characteristics to it, this image. And these are characteristics that we're going to be talking about. So this image happens to be upright. This image happens to be it's, it's minified, it's smaller, it's shrunken compared to the, uh, the, the real tree, the real object. And this image is what we call virtual. It's not a real image. That means that the light appears to be coming from a location of the image, but it's actually truly not coming from that location because it's actually behind the mirror. And so that, that's an image formed by a mirror. Over here on the right, we've got another image. Um, this is an image of this eye here. Again, it's not the real eye. It's an image of the eye. Um, and this one's formed by a, a lens, actually a convex lens. 
This image is also upright, it's the right way up. Uh, this one is magnified, it's bigger than the, um, the, the, the real eye, the true eye, and this one is also a, a virtual image, not a real image, i.e. that the light appears to be coming from a location, but it's actually not coming from those, that location. So those are all the things we're going to kind of talk about when we talk about images over the next, next uh, two, this class and the next class. So we'll be talking about images, we'll be talking about the formation of images, and we'll be discussing the magnification or the minification of the images. We'll be discussing things like um, whether they're upright or inverted. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, whether they're real or virtual. These are the properties, the characteristics, the nature of images. So, when we talk about images formed by um, mirrors, the images are formed by reflection of the mirrors. So that's how the images are formed. When we talk about images that are formed by lenses, next class, those images are formed by refraction, the bending of the light rays when they pass through the lenses. So um, the work we do in today's class with mirrors and the work we do in the next class with lenses is based on the laws of reflection and the laws of refraction we met in Tuesday's class. Um, as I say, we're going to be exploring all these properties of whether the um, images are magnified or minified or whether they're real or um, uh, virtual or whether they're upright or inverted, that language. Um, images, equations, formulas, and sketches, drawings of images can either be in a kind of world where they're, they, they're ra relatively simple or in a world where they're very, very complex. So um, we're going to meet the simple equations and the simple ways of diagramming the formation of images. In, in our world, where we use the simple equations uh, and the um, simple diagrams for the formation of images, it's as if the images are perfect, absolutely perfect copies of the object, of you or I or the tree. In reality, images of objects aren't perfect copies. They're actually distorted copies. Um, so they're distorted in different ways. The colors get distorted. Um, the shapes get distorted. Those distortions are called aberrations. That's a very complicated topic we're not going to talk about from now on. We're just going to imagine that these images are perfect copies of the objects themselves, perfect copies of you, I, or the tree. Okay, so for the case of images formed by mirrors, which is today's class, everything is based on the law of reflection. And so I'm just reminding you here of the law of reflection. So if you remember, Reflection occurs when light strikes a boundary between two optical materials. Upstairs here above the horizontal line could be air. Downstairs here could be um, glass, could be water, could be ice. The law of reflection simply says that the um, uh, reflected angle of the light ray going out towards the right here is the, um, uh, equal to the incident angle of the light ray coming in from the left here. So that's, that's the law of refraction. And all our work on mirrors, all our equations for mirrors, all our diagramming for the mirrors is going to be based on this one simple law. So that's all we need to know. That's, that is the basement of what we're do, exploring today. OK. Firstly, then, images formed by flat, plain, planar mirrors. And then we'll go on to images formed by curved spherical mirrors. So this slide shows, us, shows you how we would diagram the formation of an image by a planar mirror. And diagramming image formation is important. We'll do it also for curved mirrors. So let me explain this diagram. I'm going to explain this diagram in, in detail because we're going to be drawing similar diagrams 
to get a bit more complicated when we start talking about the curved mirrors. So on this diagram, there's a, a lot of new language for us, a lot of new notation for us or terminology for us. Um, this horizontal line here is called the optical axis. And that optical axis is perpendicular to the mirror itself. This vertical line here, this is the mirror. And so that's the starting point. We've got a mirror standing vertically. We've got its optical axis lying horizontally uh, in our little diagram here. Over here on the left-hand side, this is what we call the object. So this is the real tree or the real you or the real me that we're going to make a likeness, a copy, a representation, an image of. I've labeled it O. For object. Over here on the right-hand side in magenta, I've got the image that's formed of the, um, the object. So this is the likeness, the image of the, the you or the eye or the tree or whatever. And we are drawing them sitting on the optical axis, and we draw them as these little arrows, these little vertical arrows on this horizontal optical axis where important things are, how far are they, or how close are they to the mirror? How high or short are they from the optical axis? So those are characteristics. Those are properties of the um, image in the object. In addition to that, on this, um, on this diagram here, I've marked, I've indicated several rays, several light rays that emerge from the object and um, reflect off the mirror according to law of reflection and tell us where, infer where the image appears in our eye. So if we, if we look at this diagram here, I've actually drawn two rays. There's one in blue and there's one downstairs here in red. And um, let's start with the blue ray. So the blue ray heads horizontal to the optical axis. That's the way I've drawn it. And if it heads horizontal to the optical axis, it's going to strike the mirror at an incident angle of zero degrees. And it's going to be re reflected back an incident angle of a uh, reflected angle of zero degrees. So it actually comes back where it came from. So it heads in along the, um, the normal to the mirror. It heads back along the normal to the mirror. And so uh, here's the incoming ray. And over here on the left is the outgoing ray. So that's one ray that you could draw. It's just drew, drawing it. It's just based on law of ref reflection. Here's a second ray I drew. This is the red ray. And you see this red light ray strikes the um, mirror at the location of the optical axis. And it reflects off the mirror and travels back towards the left. And again, I've drawn this ray so it obeys, obeys the law of reflection. Uh, this incident angle here, in this corner here, between the normal to the mirror and the ray itself, I try to draw up to be equal to this reflected angle here, which is measured again from the normal to the mirror and the direction of the ray. So this is the law of reflection too. So that's two example rays um, from the object being reflected off the mirror. And um, th this slide has slid over to the, the left here. But there's a giant eye here. You can just see the pupil of the giant eye. And this is my giant eye observing these reflected light rays. And that information heads into my not-so-giant brain, and it gets processed. And my brain says, where are those light rays coming from? Where's that blue light ray? Where's that red light ray coming from? And I process those light rays and reconstruct where they're coming from. Where's the common point that they're coming from? 
the common point that they're coming from appears to be, well, my brain traces this ray backwards over here towards the right. My brain traces this ray backwards over here towards the right, and they cross here. So when I see the image, I view the image as located here. And so this is how you construct the location of the image. And this is how we construct the location of the image in this relatively simple case where we've got a planar mirror and we've just drawn two rays. This is how we'll construct the image when we've got curved mirrors and we'll draw more rays and we'll find out where the image is located. The brain is seeing the reflected rays or the eyes are seeing the reflected rays. I don't know what then goes on. The, the, that information goes into neurons or whatever. And you re finally you reconstruct where you think those rays are coming from. And I would be thinking that those rays are coming from a common point that is over here. This is the image location. So that's our first ray tracing for images formed of objects by a planar mirror. And a lot more of the class is going to be about ray tracing of images formed of objects in, in, in various mirrors. There's an equation. There's a couple of equations that we can turn this ray tracing into. And I'm just going to give you these equations. There's, they're going to be equations that tell you the position of the image. And they're going to be equations that tell you the magnification of the image. So those are going to be the two important equations that we meet for the, the planar mirror here and we meet for the curved mirrors later on. The equations are down here. The ray tracing was up here. This was the ray tracing from the last slide. And the key to these equations, I'll just tell you what the key is. We won't w worry about deriving it. It's the fact that when we drew the rays, we formed two triangles. There was a triangle over here on the uh, front side of the mirror. There was a triangle on the back side of the mirror. They're in green and magenta. And they're identical triangles. And those identical triangles actually lead you to these equations. But let's focus on these equations. So the one on the left, upstairs here, is an equation for the position of the image. The one downstairs here on the left, this is an equation for the magnification of the image. And the equations for the position of the image and the magnification of the image are going to tell us all the properties of the image. So they're going to tell us where it is how big it is. They also tell us those things, we'll see how this works, about whether the image is upright or inverted, whether the image is real or, uh, or virtual. So all that's coded in these two equations for the image position and the image magnification. So a little bit of notation here first, because I added some notation on this diagram. P is for some reason that I don't know, the, the symbol that we give for the distance of the object from the mirror. So this is the object distance, P. Q, for some other reason I don't know, is the, um, the symbol that we give to the distance of the image from the mirror. And so this is the image distance, Q. H and H prime are the heights of the object and the heights of the image respectively. For a flat mirror, for a planar mirror, for this mirror up here, the position of the image is the same distance behind the mirror that the object was in front of the mirror. So Q equals minus P. Object images that would be in front of a mirror would have a positive distance associated with them. Object images behind a mirror would have a negative distance associated with them. This minus sign will take the positive location of the image of the object, so that's the object distance, and turn it into a negative, same size, but negative location of the image because the image is behind the mirror and the object was in front of the mirror. And so the minus sign here is important. What about the magnification for the planar mirror? The magnification, what we mean by the magnification, is the, this height of the image 
in comparison to the height of the object. So it would be h prime over h. The, the, the magnification of a planar mirror is actually always just 1. And um, here, I've written plus 1. I've written plus 1 because if the image is upright, which means the same way up as the object, then that's a positive magnification. If the image is um, uh, upside down, um, uh, that would be a um, that would be a, a negative a, a negative magnification. So all that information is is coded about the image properties is coded in this equation too. Okay, so after all that story of these equations, the the image of an object in a planar mirror is a rather simple image. It's the same distance behind the mirror that the object was in front of the mirror. Uh, it's the same way up as the object was in front of the mirror. And it's the same size, magnification one, uh, copy of the uh, object that was in front of the mirror. Let me show you a demonstration of the reflection of a planar mirror. I'm going to show it as a video because I think it's going to be clearer if I do it as a video rather than a demonstration. And actually, I'm going to show this video a couple of times. Uh, both for the planar, mid, uh, planar mirror and for the um, curved mirror. So what I'm showing you here is the components of the equipment. Uh, that's a planar mirror. And this is a curved mirror. Actually, there's curves that curve inwards on this side. And if you reverse it, there's a curve on the other side. So we can do two types of, um, two types of mirrors. Now, I'm going to mount the planar mirror, which is what we've been talking about, in this, in this little device here. And over here on the right, I'm going to be able to shine light rays, like we drew light rays, onto that mirror. And so you see the three light rays coming in from the left. They're striking the mirror, and they're being actually reflected back along the path they came. If I tilt the mirror, then they're not striking the normal to the mirror, and so that they're reflected according to the law of reflection. This is how we constructed our ray trace diagram for the planar mirror. This is how we constructed our um, uh, formulas for the planar mirror. So that's just to show you that everything is based on the law of reflection. OK, I want to move on to um, curved mirrors from planar mirrors. Um, curved mirrors offer a whole new world of things that you can do to images that you couldn't do with planar mirrors. Um, planar mirrors are kind of the boring co cousins of curved mirrors. Um, they, they can't magnify or minify. The image is the same size as the object. Um, they can't really do anything about the location of the image of the object. It's always the same distance behind the mirror as the object was in front of the mirror. Uh, with curved mirrors, you've got a whole new world of being them able to magnify, minify, turn objects upside down or not turn them upside down, make them close to the mirror, make them far from the mirror. So there's a whole new world that's going to emerge here. So firstly, this slide is just to introduce a bit more language about how we describe curved mirrors. We can't just say the mirror was curved. We need a, a quantitative language for the, for the mirror. The first thing I want to mention is that there's really two types of curved mirrors, two distinct types. And we, We've got these two types here. One of them is what we call a um, 
concave mirror, and, and one of them is a convex mirror. So um, this, is a, this is a concave mirror where the mirror is kind of, the edges of the mirror are kind of caving in towards the center. So that's a concave mirror. And um, this one's a convex mirror. In this one, the opposite is true. These edges are kind of bending outwards, bowing outwards from the, the center. So this, firstly, there's two types of mirrors. Um, concave mirrors over here on the right, uh, convex mirrors over there on the left. The concave mirrors have a property, we'll see this, that they tend to converge, bring the light together, converge the light. So that you might hear these called converging mirrors too. The concave mirrors, they have a property that they tend to spread out the light. And um, we call those diverging mirrors. They diverge the light rays. So we've got these two brands of mirrors, first of all. Once you've got curved mirrors, you've got concave, convex. Uh, you've got converging, diverging. In a way, the converging, diverging is a better language because it sort of tells you what happens to the light rays. Uh, the convex, the concave is just words you've got to get, remember associated with these two mirrors. So the mirror that I drew here, the mirrored face is here, kind of caves inwards. So this is a concave mirror. It's a converging mirror. It converges light rays. So what's the language for describing our mirrors? Well, in this picture, I've drawn the mirror. I've drawn the optical axis again. It goes straight through the center of the mirror. And then on that optical axis, I've drawn two new points that we use for describing curved mirrors. One of them is the radius of curvature, and the other one is called the, the focal point of the focal length. So uh, the radius of curvature is labeled C. The focal point is labeled F. The radius of curvature is simply the radius of curvature of the mirror. So this point is located at a position on the optical axis that corresponds to the radius of curvature of this mirror. If I was to swing this little arrow around, it would skim along the surface of the mirror. So that's what we call the radius of curvature. That's one way of describing the curved mirror. Um, a way that we often use, because it turns out to be a bit more useful, is the focal length. The focal length is actually the point, a point that's midway between the mirror's face and the radius of curvature. So the, the, the focal length is half the radius of curvature. And so this F and this C, this radius of curvature, this focal length, are the two, two ways that we'll describe curved mirrors. Now, for the case of a concave mirror, this is, remember, this is the one that's folding inwards and converging the light rays. The focal length and the radius of curvature are, are positive numbers. For a convex mirror, that's the one that's kind of bowing outwards like this, that's the one that's going to diverge the light rays. The radius of curvature and the focal length are, are negative numbers. So it's with the signs, plus or minus, we, we distinguish between converging and diverging lenses, or concave, convex, sorry, concave, convex mirrors. So that was our language. And now I want to show you how I would draw an image formed of an object by, we're going to start with the um, concave lens. So this looks like a, a busy slide with a lot of information on it. Um, it's actually just a slide where I'm trying to show you how to ray trace with a um, a concave lens, and what rays to draw, what rays we usually draw, because they're the most helpful rays, when you have a, a concave lens. So um, that's all this stuff down here. Over here is just a picture of an object, a candle, in front of a concave mirror, uh, and here's the image being formed. And um, we're going to try and reproduce this image of this object by our ray tracing over here on the, um, on, on the left-hand side. So let's talk about this diagram then. 
Uh, here's our concave lens. I keep saying lens. Here's our concave um, mirror. This side, the left side, is kind of the shiny side of the mirror. That's the front. This side over here, this is the bit that's stuck to the bathroom wall. This is the back. This horizontal line, again, is the optical axis. And buried on that line is the radius of curvature and the focal point. Here is the object. So this is you, me, or the tree, drawn as a vertical arrow here. And we're going to discover over here, this is the image. This is the image that gets formed uh, for, of this object. We're going to discover, look, it's, it's been minified. It's not a real word, but it's been shrunk. Um, it's been made smaller. We'll discover that. It's being turned upside down. The arrow is not pointing above the optical axis. It's pointing below the optical axis. We'll discover that. And it's also closer to the mirror than the object was to the mirror. So we'll figure that out. And we're going to figure all that out firstly by tracing some rays, tracing some light rays. OK, and when we trace the light rays, we're really just using, this is where we would be using the um, uh, law of reflection. All our light rays have to obey the law of reflection. OK, so I've got uh, four different light rays on this slide here. Um, I got a black one, I got a, um, a, a red one, and I got a blue and a, and a green one. And I'm just going to go through those, those four different rays. Um, if you had never done ray tracing before, and I said trace a ray uh, that reflects off the curved mirror, uh, that travels to the right and then reflects off and travels back to the left, you might draw this black ray here. So this is the most obvious, I call this the most obvious physics ray. This is the most obvious physics ray because this is the one, you know, it strikes the center of the mirror, it reflects off the center of the mirror, and it clearly shows that the angle of incidence measured with respect to the optical axis is equal to the angle of reflection with respect to the optical axis. It clearly, absolutely clearly shows the law of reflection. So that's one ray that you can draw. The trouble with drawing that ray is that, the trouble with drawing that ray is you have to be really careful about sketching an incident and reflected angle that's equal. So it's actually, it's the most obvious ray to draw, but it's actually the hardest ray to draw. So I've drawn it on there, but often we don't draw that ray, to be honest with you. The rays that we do tend to draw are the following. They're the ones that are red, blue, and green. So the, let's talk about the red ray. So the red ray it comes from the object. And the rule for the red ray is it's going to go towards the mirror through the radius of curvature. And it's actually going to come back from the mirror through the radius of curvature. So you just need to draw a straight line through the radius of curvature, and you draw on that ray. You see, this is the particular ray that will strike the mirror with zero degree angle of incidence, and therefore have zero degree angle for its reflection. And therefore, it travels from the mirror along the same path that it arrived at the mirror. And so it's a very easy ray to draw. You just draw a straight line through the radius of curvature. So this is a good one to draw. The other two rays. I think of the other two rays, blue and, and um, that's green, that's the word. Um, I think of those as kind of brother or sister or cousins, right? And they're brother and sister or cousins in, in, in the, the following sense. So look at the blue ray. It heads in parallel to the optical axis, and it is reflected out of the mirror back from the mirror, through the focal point. So that's how that ray, that's how I drew that ray. That was the rule for, rule for drawing that ray. What about the, um, the green ray? The green ray heads in through the focal point, reflects off the mirror, and heads out parallel to the optical axis. 
So they are really brother and sister or cousins because one goes in parallel, comes out through the focal point. The other one goes in through the focal point, comes out parallel. Now that rule of going in parallel, coming out through the focal point, or going in through the focal point, coming out parallel, obeys the law of reflection. This blue ray obeys the law of reflection. Up here, the angle of incidence, angle of reflection are the same. This green ray obeys the law of reflection. Angle of incidence and angle of reflection are the same. The rays you construct by going in parallel and coming out through the focal point, or vice versa, obey that law of reflection. So these are also two really good rays to draw, because you can draw parallel rays to the optical axis. You can draw lines that come out or go in through the focal point. OK, again, I've lost my giant eye that is located over here and behind it a giant brain processing the information. Um, my eye over here on the left sees these different rays coming in. So there's the black, the red, the green, and the blue rays. And um, it's going to say, where are those light rays coming from? What is the common point that those light rays are coming from? Because that's where the image is located, where those light rays converge to. And so my brain processing this optical information is going to trace back um, the, these light rays to some common point. Well, look, this red light ray comes from this direction. This green light ray is coming out horizontally, crosses the red light ray here. This um, black light ray is coming downwards. If I trace it back, it also crosses the light ray the, the red light ray here, and even the blue light ray is going way down here into my giant eye, but it, it appears to come from this common point too. So if you look at this blue ray, this black ray, this green ray, this red ray here, these are the outgoing rays, the four outgoing rays. They're all coming from this common point. This is where my brain decides the image is. This is where the image is. And so we construct the image there. To construct the image there, it's going to be shrunk, smaller, it's going to be upside down. It's below the axis rather than above the axis. And it's going to be much closer to the mirror than the object is. And so that's what we discovered, that in this configuration with this object and this concave lens, this is where the image is formed. This is what this picture is of. So if you look at this picture, here was the object, and here is the image. Here is the concave lens. This image is smaller than this object. This image is upside down. And this image is actually closer to, the location of this image is closer to the mirror than this object was to the mirror. And so this is an example of this situation here. Not exactly to scale, but it is this situation here where you've made a real image. Light rays are really coming from this point. Uh, that is inverted and is minified. <clears throat> Not only can you draw the formation of the image for the, the convex uh, uh, mirror, you can um, write down equations that describe the image formation by a convex mirror. Um, again, these equations are really just rooted in geometry, and they're rooted in the law of reflection, just like the equations for the um, planar mirror were rooted in geometry, and they were rooted in um, uh, the law of reflection. So I'm not going to describe how you get these equations. That would take us way off into the evening. Um, but we're going to quote these and work with these equations. Again, there's two of them. So there's two equations here. And again, these two equations, one tells you about the position of the image, and one tells you about the um, magnification of the image. That's just what the planar mirror equations did. And also encoded in those equations, in plus or minus signs, is actually whether the image is uh, real or virtual, whether the image is um, upright or inverted, uh, and, and so on. So all that information, all those important features are encoded in these two little equations. Here's the equation for the position of the image. We call it the mirror equation. Here's the equation downstairs for the magnification of the image, magnification e equations. 
Uh, let's just talk about these. So this is a little bit more complicated than the equation for the planar mirror. And this is a little bit more complicated than the equation for the planar mirror, for the magnification. Um, the extra ingredient that's in these equations is now the focal length. So now we've got a curved mirror. It's characterized by a focal length. That's going to be a character in our uh, equation. That's going to be a symbol in our equations. We see it here. So now the image position Q is related to the object position P and also the focal length of your, of your mirror. And so this is now a relation not just between the image and object positions, but the image, object, and focal length of the, um, of the lens. And so this, this equation, if you know the, I keep saying lens, of the, this, if you know the focal length of the mirror and you know the object position, you can calculate the image position. This is the magnification equation. The magnification, again, it's just the ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object, is now not equal to 1. It's equal to this little equation that is a ratio, a ratio of the image position and the object position. So, for example, here, if the image is closer than the object is to the, to the mirror, then the magnification is going to be smaller, smaller than one. We're going to be minified. If the uh, image location was actually further from the mirror than the object, then um, you'd have the case where you get a, a, a magnification that's greater than one. The image would be, would be bigger. And again, the signs, the signs tell us important things. So um, the sign of P, if the um, object is in front of the mirror, is going to be positive. The sign of Q, if the image is in front of the mirror, the Q is going to be positive. If the image was behind the mirror, it's not here, Q is going to be negative. So that tells us whether the image is real or virtual. Uh, the sign down here will tell us whether the, um, the, the, the image is inverted or upright. So if, if this calculation gives you a negative magnification, which is the case here, the image is upside down. If it was a positive magnification, the image would be upright. OK, let me show you. Um, a demonstration. I think I'm going to show you two movies now. So it's like, you know, when you, you get an extra movie. OK, so now I'm going to take this, um, this, this concave mirror, remember it's bending inwards, and um, put it into this device. And really here I'm just showing you that the concave mirror does converge the rays. And the, it's converging them towards the so focal point. I want to stop it there if I can. That location where those rays are being converged to, no, that doesn't help. That, that's the focal point, and that's that key point uh, that light rays are converged to, and it's our, how we understand the converging lens, how we understand the concave lens. is how It's the guide to how we draw, do the ray tracing for the concave lens. The other thing I want to show you is just the whole world of the concave, concave mirror. So what, what I'm going to show you here is, uh, this is the concave mirror over here on the um, uh, left-hand side of the classroom. And I've, I'm, I'm standing here, and I've got a camera. And um, you're going to see, you can see the image of me here. And look. Um, the image of me is exactly the kind of image we were just sketching uh, and computing 
with the equations. This image of me is, look, obviously I'm um, inverted. Uh, obviously I'm minified, smaller. And I appear closer to the mirror than I actually am to the mirror. And what I'm going to do is just walk towards the mirror, and you're going to see uh, this whole world of things you can do with the images with a concave mirror. I seem to be a little unsteady on my feet at this point. But <laughs> Here I come. Uh, you see my image. I'm inverted, I'm inverted, I'm inverted. This is a fantastic moment. This is the... I've suddenly become the right way up and truly magnified. And then I'll start walking away again and suddenly there's a point at which I get inverted again and I'm minified again. And this is the whole world of things you can do with a concave mirror. It's really quite fantastic. Okay, I'm going to stop it there because that's going ahead too far. And I want to move on from concave mirrors. So one, you know, if you go to a shop, the mirror shop, and you say, I, I want to buy a mirror, the first thing they're going to ask you is, do you want a concave or a convex mirror? And so we've just done the concave mirrors. Now we're going to do the convex mirrors at the mirror shop. So we're going to learn how to draw the image formation by the convex mirror. We're going to learn the equations for the image formation by the convex mirror. We're going to explore the world of the convex mirror. And what's going to help us is that the drawing, the equations, and the exploring are so, so similar to the concave mirror um, that um, we can do these next few slides much more quickly than the, um, the con concave mirror. And that I feel good about, because otherwise I'm never going to get to the examples that I plan to get to. OK. So um, again, this slide has a ray tracing over here on the left-hand side, for this time a con convex mirror. And then it has a, um, a picture over here on the right-hand side that is a picture of this particular situation. Uh, with the convex, convex mirror. If we look at this situation, right, here's my mirror standing vertically. The front is on the left, right? The shiny side is on the left. The back stuck to the bathroom wall. That's on the right. Through the center of the mirror is the optical axis. It's this horizontal line here. I didn't even bother to label it. I've marked on that optical axis the... Um, the focal point and the radius of curvature. These two things that characterize the mirror. Look, here's a difference. For the concave mirror, I mark them on the front side of the, um, of the mirror. That's because the concave mirror, F and C are positive numbers. For the convex mirror, I mark them on the back side of the mirror. That's because that's the negative locations. That's because F and C for the convex mirror, then they're negative values. And so I'm putting them over here. So that's an important difference. OK. Here's the object. So this is me, you, I, the tree, or the candle even. So this is where we put the um, object. And um, over here, this is where the image is, is formed. And we're going to see why this is where the image is formed. Uh, this image, if you look at it, is, um, is um, minified. It's shrunken. It's uh, upright, so it's the correct way up. Uh, and it's um, behind the mirror, but closer to the mirror than the object. So those are all the kind of features, the characteristics of this. We're going to discover them by ray tracing them. Again, on this slide, I've drawn ray, four rays. 
There's the um, obvious physics ray, which is the worst ray to draw, but reminds us of the, um, the, the basis for drawing these rays in the law of reflection. And then there's the three other colored rays, the, the red, the blue, the green, that are the ones that we typically draw because they're easy to, and straightforward to construct. And they use the, the focal point and the radius of a curvature of your particular mirror. So let's, let's start drawing these rays. Again, lost from my slide, uh, which was the thing that took me the longest to draw um, is my giant eye that's over here and my, my brain that's processing that information. But anyway, um, I, I, I will resent that after the class. Um, but anyway, uh, here comes the physics obvious ray. It's the ray in black. It heads towards the optical axis from the top of the object. It, it strikes the center of the, um, the mirror it's at the location of the optical axis, and it's reflected downwards uh, over here towards the, uh, towards the left. I've drawn it such that the uh, incident angle here measured with the normal to the mirror is equal to the reflected angle here measured with respect to the normal to the mirror. Uh, so that's where the law of reflection comes in. So this is one ray you could draw. And as I say, the problem here is I've got to make a judgment about this line being the same angle from the horizontal axis as this line. And I, I'm looking at it now, and I didn't think I got it quite right. So um, this is the physics obvious ray, the physics sort of understanding ray, but it's not the easiest one to draw. Um, the red ray. Remember the red ray from the concave mirror? It went in towards the mirror through the radius of curvature, come outwards from the mirror through the radius of curvature. So it goes in on the path and comes back out 180 degrees back along that path. Same sort of idea for the um, a convex mirror. You're going to go in towards the radius of curvature, and then you'll come back out along that path. The real difference is in the um, concave case, the radius of curvature was um, in front of the mirror. Now the radius of curvature is behind the mirror. So how do we do that? We draw the red ray as heading towards the radius of curvature, as if it's going to get there. But it strikes the mirror first and comes back straight down the path it came from. If you look at this ray going in and ray coming out, it is obeying the law of reflection, right? The incident angle is zero degrees if it goes towards the radius of curvature. The reflected angle is zero degrees when it goes towards the radius of curvature. So this is this ray that's handy to draw. In towards C, out along the same path he came in. Then we've got the brother and sister, the two cousins, or the whatevers. Um, uh, Tweedle, dumb, and tweedle, whatever it is. Um, so they're the ones that go in parallel or come out parallel. They're the ones that go in towards the focal point or come out from the focal point. Again, we've got the difference here from the concave mirror. The concave mirror, that was the, the focal point was in front of the mirror. So they would just go in through that point or come out through that point. Really, the rays would pass through that point. Now we've got the focal point behind the mirror so that they can't actually go through the focal point. Rather, they have to appear to go in towards the focal point or appear to come out from the focal point. And so that's what I'm drawing here. So look, take a look at the blue ray. The blue ray, she comes in parallel to the optical axis strikes the mirror, and then reflects in such a way that that blue ray, ray appears to come from the focal point. The green ray, he goes in um, uh, towards the focal point, but he can't get to the focal point because he's going to strike the mirror first. When he strikes the mirror, green ray, green ray is reflected off parallel to the optical axis. So that's how we draw that pair. Uh, that involve the focal point and parallel rays, they're not going to ever reach the focal point. They just head towards it, or they just appear to come from it. Well, now we're going to tell the story of the eye and the brain. The, the giant eye is collecting four light rays over here that I've sketched. There's the black one downstairs, there's the uh, green and the red, and then there's even the blue 
it was, you know, somewhere up here, my giant eye is collecting that ray. And my giant brain is saying, where are these four rays coming from? What's the co they all came from the top of the object. What's the, what's the common location I, I, I see them coming from? And so my giant brain uh, is going to reconstruct those light rays to work the common point that they appear to come from. So let's do that. Um, where to start? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Red ray. Red ray, here it is. So I've reconstructed this dashed line, which is where the red ray could come from anywhere along this path here. Green ray, this is a horizontal one. Let's do this one next. Comes from this horizontal path. So I re start reconstructing that. And I say, hey, look. This is the common point with the red ray, this point here. Then I say, well, let's try the blue ray. The blue ray is heading upstairs here through the roof. Uh, I, I reconstruct where it might be coming from. And oh, look, it comes from the same point as the, um, the red ray and the green ray. And even the poorly drawn black ray approximately comes from that point. And so this location here is the point my brain, my mind, my eyes have decided that the rays come from. And this is where the image is located. And we see, therefore, that this image has is smaller. This image is behind the lens mirror. So it can't really be there, right? This is inside the bathroom wall. Obviously, it's not inside the bathroom wall. That's not possible. We know that. It just appears to be inside the bathroom wall. I, if you look at yourself in a mirror, you appear to be inside the bathroom wall. You know you're not really in there. Uh, so this is a virtual image. And uh, we happen to see that it's closer to the backside of the mirror than the object was to the front side of the mirror. This is all pictured over here. Here's a convex mirror. Here's an object in front of it. Here's the image that's formed. It's smaller. This image is smaller. It's upright. This image is upright. And it appears to be behind the mirror. This appears to be behind the mirror. So this is a photograph of this situation. Not exactly to scale. Again, the magnification is not quite right. But it is a representation of this situation. OK. Got to hurry up. <laughs> Start, starting to have a panic attack here, um, which none of us want to see. Um, OK. Um, equations. The equations for the convex mirror, this is a moment of relief. They're, they're exactly the same as the equations for the um, concave mirror. The, the, the mirror equation for the position of the image is the same. The um, uh, uh, magnification equation for the size of the image, that's also the same. So this equation we met before, this equation we met before, um, f is the characteristic of now the concave convex mirror rather than concave mirror. Um, but P is the object position. Q is the object uh, uh, image position. And M is the magnification. And these two equations are identical. The only thing that's different when you use these equations for the concave mirror versus the convex mirror or vice versa is that if you're working with the concave mirror that we first w worked with, the focal lengths are, uh, are positive. If you're working with the convex mirror, the focal lengths are negative. So there's nothing different about the equations. There's just something different about the sign of the focal length. So that's very, very handy. OK. What's this say? Demonstrate. <clears throat> OK, again, I'm going to show you two videos, uh, one, both of them with the convex mirror. One just to show you the rays and the law of reflection for the convex mirror. And then another one to show you the world, the world of convex mirrors. OK, so this was the concave one. But let's, let, let's Get, I've got an assistant up here. He's going to remove it. I mean, I hope he is. Yeah. And he's just going to reverse it, because the other side of this mirror, this fantastic trick we learned, 
is also mirrored. And now you see why the convex mirror is called a diverging lens. You can see there, I think, that some of the rays are being diverged from the optical axis. And hopefully, yeah, the assistant's going to turn the light off. And now we see those rays diverging. And they're actually diverging away from the focal point. And so we kind of can imagine the focal point as we see those rays diverge away from the optical axis. It's situated behind the, the mirror rather than in front of the mirror. And now the second screening. This is me again tottering up like some old person towards the, um, which I am, to the mirror. This is now the convex mirror. Not quite as exciting as the last case. Um, I never went upside down. I actually never got magnified. And convex mirrors don't have as big as world as the con concave mirrors. So they, they don't, you can't magnify with a, a convex mirror. You can't um, invert the image with a convex mirror. And so they aren't the same, they don't have the same scope. They don't have the same enormous universe that the, um, the, the concave mirror has. I always get asked this question, do I need to remember all the signs of all the different things for the exam? No, you don't need to remember the signs for all the different things for the exams. You'll get that as a table. Um, that's because I can't remember all the signs for all the different things, so I'm going to give you that table. I mean, I can remember them for about 30 minutes after this class, and then it kind of fades away. So, Examples. I've got one example for a plane mirror and one example for a, um, a, a curved, curved mirror. Um, whether I get to the curved mirror or not is uh, not clear to me. Um, if I don't, I'll, I'll make a little post of it um, uh, in Canvas. OK, uh, in this question, we've got a choir stands on the right wall, and an organist sits on the left wall. So here's the right wall, here's the left wall, here's the choir, here's the organist. The organist uses a 0.6 meter wide mirror to see the choir. So the organist is facing the left, but has a mirror here to see the choir, to, I guess, check that they're still there. What width of the right wall can the organist see? Sounds like a horrible geometrical high school problem. Um, and in some sense, it is a horrible geometrical high school problem. But it is about plane mirrors and the images that are formed by plane mirrors. And it does give us another opportunity to work with constructing the images of plane mirrors um, and working with the equations for plane mirrors. So um, I started, again, I'm very frustrated that every important thing that I drew is in the, you know, on my slides in the, you know, exactly on the left side and being lost. Um, but I started with a, a ray tracing diagram of what's going on. A, a ray tracing diagram in which I'm going to ray trace the um, image formation of the object here. So, look, um, in this diagram, so here again is the organist. Here is the choir. Here's the left-hand wall. Here's the right-hand wall. And here's, here's the mirror. And um, I'm going to construct the image that the organist sees of the object, which is the choir. 
So here's a light ray that's coming from the choir. So from the object, this is a light ray from the object that's heading towards the mirror, striking the mirror, and then heading into the eye of the, of the organist. And I've drawn this light ray based on, what have I based it on? The law of reflection. So the incident angle here, the light ray as it travels towards the left, is equal to the reflected angle as it travels towards the right. And so this is a, an example light ray I could draw for a, for a plane mirror. As we know, right, the image that the organist sees of this object, if it's a planar mirror, is an image that is behind the mirror rather than in front of the mirror. So it's going to be over here on the left rather than over here on the right. It's going to be um, the same size as the um, original object, so the magnification is one. It's going to be upright. It's the same way up as the uh, original object is. And it's going to be the same distance behind the mirror as the um, object was, the choir was, in front of the mirror. And so, although you can't quite see it, it's right over here. Over here is the, the image that I've constructed of this object based on our understanding of the image of an object in a planar mirror, that it is the same size, that it is the same distance behind the mirror as the object was in front of the mirror, uh, and that it is, is upright. And so I, I put all that information into this slide. So this distance Q, of the image behind the mirror, is 5.3 meters, because this distance P, the object distance in front of the mirror, was 5.3 meters. This height of the image is the same height as the object here. Uh, this triangle here that's built out of a horizontal side, which is the image distance, and the, um, the size of the image is the same, same as this triangle over here on the right, which is built out horizontally at the object distance and the uh, original object size of the choir. So these two triangles are the same. That sketch is going to allow me to answer the question of how much wall, how much wall can the, can the organist see? So I want to know how much of this wall can the organist see? And I'm going to calculate that amount of wall by similar triangles that are in this geometry here. So the two similar triangles are, are this triangle. There's a little triangle here in green. You see this one? It's got a horizontal side that's so the organist distance from the mirror. And it's got a vertical side that is the, um, uh, the, the size of the mirror. The mirror was 0.6 meters wide. So this is half the size of the mirror. So here's a triangle that we know. And then the other triangle is this big magenta triangle. This is a triangle that is the same shape as the green triangle, but it's just bigger in size. That means it has the same angles, the magenta triangle, as the green triangle. All the angles are the same. It's just um, all the um, sides are correspondingly larger. It means that the ratios of any sides for the magenta triangle are the same as the ratios of the sides for the green triangle. Anyway, the green triangle we exactly know. We know its width, we know its height. The um, magenta triangle, we know its horizontal distance here is the 5.3 meters plus this 0.8 meters, but we don't know its height. And its height is half of the amount of wall that the, that the organist sees. So this problem, it's really the geometry, a geometry problem, an optics problem, calculating how much wall the organist is seeing, and it's based on our understanding of the image over here on the left of an object over here on the right in a planar mirror. And so I'm going to calculate the size of this 
vertical side of the Magenta Triangle, knowing the sides of the Green Triangle, and knowing that these two triangles are, are similar to one another. So, so let me go ahead and do that. So this is my picture based on the image formed of the object in the planar mirror that's going to allow me to solve this problem of how much war does the, does the organist see. So in this picture, if you look at it, there's, two, there's the little triangle that I constructed, this one here. Horizontal side is the organist's distance from the mirror. Vertical side is half the width of the mirror. And then there's the big triangle. Vertical side is unknown. It's half, half the size of the amount of wall that the organist sees. The horizontal side is known. It's the distance of the organist from the mirror plus the distance of the image of the choir behind the mirror. So um, this is 5.8 meters, no, 5.3, yeah, 5.8 meters. Uh, something's gone wrong here. This is, this is 5.3, sorry. This, I've got number dy dyslexia on here. God. I've done it again. <laughs> Going to have to cut this bit out of the video for sure. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Getting back to the, so clearly I'm never going to do the other problem. Um, I got the small triangle, I know it's horizontal and vertical sides. I got the big triangle, I know it's horizontal side, I don't know it's vertical side, and that's what I want. Uh, I know they're similar triangles. All this is based on my understanding of the planar mirror and the law of reflection. So, because they're similar triangles, the ratio of the vertical side of the big triangle to the horizontal side of the big triangle, which is 6.1 meters, is equal to the ratio of the vertical side of the small triangle to the horizontal side of the small triangle. This is just similar triangles. And so if I want the value of y, all I got to do is multiply through by 6.1 meters on the left and the right. And when I did that, I don't dare write these numbers down, I got 2.3 meters. So this distance up here is 2.3 meters. The width of the wall then that the organist sees, this is just half the image of the choir. There's another half the image of the choir on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the organist, is twice Y. And so this width that the organist sees is uh, 4.6 meters. And so that was based on the, um, based on the uh, understanding of the planar mirror and the uh, law of reflection and the image properties in a, in a planar mirror.